Hello, and welcome to our series, Women in E-Mobility. EV Noir's work centers on electric, connected, shared, and autonomous mobility solutions. I'm Dr. Shelley Francis. I am a co-founder and managing partner here at EV Noir. So we focus on two areas of work, which are e-mobility best practices and e-mobility diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, during this series, we'll talk with leaders working across the e-mobility ecosystem. We focus on engaging women leaders, our conversations center on their career trajectory, how they got started working on the electrification space and what it's like to work in the sector, as well as we'll explore emerging issues and trends. We're in the middle of a huge shift in how we conceive, power and innovate in our sector is driven by awareness of climate impacts as well as economic opportunities. So there's no better time than now to dive in. And today's session is brought to you by the team at EV Noir. So we are excited to talk with Sue Gander. Sue Gander, or Sue, we'll just use Sue for short today. She currently serves as the director of the Electric School Bus Initiative for the World Resource Institute, WRI. So Sue, we're excited to have you here today and welcome to Women in E-Mobility. Great, thank you, Dr. Francis. I am thrilled to be here. Um, you're combining many of my favorite topics, women and e-mobility and equity and um, and then getting to talk with you, so. Oh, wonderful, well, we are so excited yeah. to have you here. I know we're gonna have a good conversation. And so we can just go ahead and dive right in. Okay. All right, so if we look at your bio and your work experience and everything that you bring to the table in this conversation, you've had quite an impressive career path of working in DC. You work for the Department of Justice, DOJ. You work for the EPA as well. And then you also uh, provided leadership while at the National Governors Association. That's where we actually first connected. So obviously you have you know, done a lot uh, and influenced a lot of people throughout your career. But before we take a journey into how you got to the transportation and e-mobility space, but tell us more about your current role and tell us like, what's a typical day in the life of Sue Gander, the director of the school bus <laughs> electrification effort? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll start with a little bit of how I ended up at my current role. Um, and I have to say it's somewhat of a dream job um, being able to work on a project that focuses on electric school buses is really exciting. It's a really incredible dynamic space. And I'm thrilled um, that um, WRI created this program. They, they've done it and we do it in partnership with the Bezos Earth Fund. Um, and so we've been able to form partnerships with a number of fabulous organizations that have been working on this topic for some time and kind of add to add to that. And um, one of the things I like best about the project is that it centers on equity. And so we think about school bus electrification and our goal is to get the entire fleet of uh, school buses in the US electrified. And um, we do that always thinking about what does this mean in terms of equity? And I know something that you often say, having the folks that are um, experiencing the worst of air quality and um, systematic racism and putting them first. And that's something that we try to remind ourselves of, of um, all the time. Plus, I get to wear this really cool pin all the time. Um, my little blinking magic electric school bus. So that makes for a lot of fun, but really it's very rewarding and you get to see the results right away. I mean, we started just a few years of, ago on this. Um, and since that time, the number of school buses, electric school buses on the road or coming soon have uh, more than tripled. So they're driving around my neighborhood. They're driving around your neighborhood. It's really, really exciting. At least I hope they're driving around your neighborhood, um, but they're in many neighborhoods, let's just say. Um, Today was actually just a banner day. It's great that you're talking to me today because I have a really good day to share, which oh, is this morning I got to drive up to Annapolis, capital of Maryland, mm -hmm. um, since 1649, and be part of a announcement from the governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, about a new funding proposal um, that is about advancing the work of Maryland on climate solutions. And one por portion of that proposal is to uh, dedicate $17 million uh, to school bus electrification. And this is on top of other things that have been going on um, mm -hmm. in the space and 
build upon some utility programs, like just another great day to say, oh, okay, we're going to get the chance to bring more buses to more kids in Maryland. And that's super exciting. And uh, the work of our partners in the space from League of Conservation Voters and CHISPA were there in a room to help celebrate. So it was like, yay, a good day. Um, so that's kind of maybe an extremely good day. There are other days that are maybe less exciting with, but still meaningful in terms of connecting with partners, trying to, you know, troubleshoot on, um, on challenges that school districts are facing, talking to utilities, um, helping encourage them along, you know, we're always putting together new tools and resources. Um, so thinking about what questions we can help answer. Um, there's, you know, no day is the same. So it, it keeps things lively. That's one of the exciting things about working in this space is that, you know, yeah. if you want the dull, you know, working on the same thing every time, know what to expect. This is not the career path for you because it is constantly moving and evolving and innovating. Right. Yes. So let's, before we get into the heart of the conversation, let's chat more about your journey into the transportation sector, specifically e-mobility. How did your career path evolve? Obviously, you worked a number of different um, positions and worked with different organizations over your career. Was working in transportation and mobility always part of your career path? As I look back and reflect on it, it actually has been, um, and it's just become more and more a part of my um, my you know my work life, if you will. Um, so maybe going back to my graduate uh, school days um, when I was studying in uh, Wisconsin, go Badgers! Um, I did a, a capstone project on the future of alternative fuels. And I think I called it something like road to nowhere. It was about like the oil, you know, oil was the road to nowhere. How are we going to move to alternative fuels? Um, and strangely enough, right there on the front cover um, or first page of my um, paper is a quote from the World Resources Institute. And now like fast forward, I'm not going to tell you how many years. Full circle. I'm working at the World Resources Institute. Hey, oh, it's really wow. great. You predicted um, so, that. Yeah, yeah, I, I really I scripted that well. You know, it, it, I didn't end up immediately working um, specifically in alternative fuels. Um, I think, you know, what's exciting about transportation, electrification and mobility is it's not just transportation, it's transportation and it's energy and it's environment and it's health and it's equity. So it really is that cross cutting set of things. I I actually first started working around um, form of transportation, outboard motors and boating being in Wisconsin, um, trying to electrify those as part of a um, an engine swap program. And then I moved from that to an aviation project. Um, I was then working with the Center for Clean Air Policy, which is a great NGO that works um, in the US and, and internationally. Uh, and so, you know, got to have that be part of my portfolio. Um, learned a lot through that, always having that climate change, air quality um, mm -hmm. connection, um, working a lot at the state level, but also federal and international, um, internationally as well. So that was kind of a first, um, first big step for me. Um, and I moved from there to, this is going to sound like a reading my resume, but I moved from there to, um, to the US EPA. Fabulous experience there for anyone mm -hmm. thinking about um, public service. I, I really couldn't say any more good. I mean, I couldn't say uh, anything bad about that. It was just mm -hmm. a great experience. Some tough times to be sure, but it um, it was great to be able to be there and um, be part of a great team that was working on state and local clean energy projects and end up doing a lot more work in the energy space, getting to know the utility industry and what that was like. Um, but we were always thinking about how energy environment were starting to get connected. And we we're always struggling with like, well, how do we pull transportation in? How do we pull yeah. transportation in? Um, and it seems kind of obvious, but, um, and, and now I think we've gotten to that point. Um, and I jumped from there to NGA where I did, I have mm -hmm. I sort of spent the majority of my career to date, I guess. Um, great opportunity to work um, with governors and their staff and, really started to dig into transportation 
electrification. That's when mm -hmm. um, sort of the first big goals around transportation were, electrification were coming out. That's where we got to meet. Right. Yeah. Um, we definitely wanted to have, um, um, you know, voices like yours in the mm -hmm. conversation coming to states and telling them about electrification, but also equity. Mm -hmm. um, that's when the VW settlement was coming out. Um, and a lot of states were looking to figure out what they were going to do with their funding. So trying to guide that funding into, um, in this case, school buses were, you know, starting to come out as a, as an option. So, um, kind of winnowing the, 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 uh, my portfolio down, um, jump from there to the electrification coalition and safe mm -hmm. where it was only about electrification. So I was like thrilled, like I'm not working on 12 other topics, <laughs> just electrification. But as you know, that's a huge mm -hmm. topic. Yes. Um, so that was a great chance to meet a lot of players and, and make a lot of, you know, frankly, good friends too, mm -hmm. um, in, you know, in this industry that's been, um, a, you know, rewarding part of, of being here. And then, um, almost three years ago, made the jump to WRI to do work specifically on, on school buses. Again, narrow piece of a bigger sector, but with so many connections that as we were talking, there's never a dull moment. So. Oh no. And it's amazing how like that, that full circle moment that you had that in your report being undergrad, I'm still stuck on that. Like that is just incredible. Yeah. I just came across my paper like a, a little while ago when I was cleaning mm -hmm. up my son's bedroom and went, oh, what the heck? <laughs> You're like, yeah, hey, this is familiar. Yeah. It's funny for me, I didn't necessarily, transportation wasn't in my kind of yeah. purview either. Like I know, you know, coming, having a health and research background, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. understanding environmental public health disparities and transportation emissions and how it's connected, you know, that made sense. But then like being able to do research and look at maternal health outcomes and child health outcomes and then be an EV driver too, it just really made sense to be able to integrate like the public health, the you know, the overall mobility and transportation space, and then you know, craft a, a business or opportunity to really work in this space and provide research guidance and thought leadership. Yeah. So it's really a wonderful opportunity to meld all the things that I really enjoyed into an organization like EV Noir. And so, um, you know, given that we work with like cities, OEMs, um, you know, manufacturers really charging network companies, charging manufacturers, transit authority cities, you know, different government entities. It's really awesome for me to be able to take that public health background, the research background, best practices, and help those different organizations guide their decarbonization strategy. So like you, I'm like, it's like a privilege to be able to work in the space and to just do something that you really enjoy and are passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. And that public health work is just so vital, you know, and, and resonates with so many people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, in th thinking about just, you know, being women who are working in the industry, clearly there um, in our day to day, we don't often see as many women. And I, in our circle, we have a lot of women colleagues um, that uh, we're able to collaborate with and, and work on different projects with. But I think, when you start thinking about the broader landscape of transportation, increasing diversity in this sector is really, really important. And one of the things we know is that from recent studies that women make uh, make over three quarters of the decisions in the household, typically, uh, particularly around vehicle purchases. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then when you start looking at the who's making up the sector of like the employees and the experts in the sector, it doesn't reflect that, right? And so that means there's a lot of work, there's a lot of opportunity for us to um, kind of level the playing field and bring more women into the space. But can you talk for a minute about what your experience has been like being a woman in the space? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, I, you can relate to this too. It hasn't always been easy. Um, I think it's getting a lot better. And that's mm -hmm. just because there's been um, more attention to um, increasing diversity and that's women, but also women of color. So critical as well. Um, yeah. It's, you know, sometimes it feels you walk into a room and you're like, Oh, Hmm. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Um, and when you combine the, you know, energy utility industry and the transportation industry, um, you know, historically, and again, this has been changing. 
it hasn't been, um, you know, it hasn't been incredibly diverse. Um, you know, that being said, you know, I've had some great male mentors and, and support mm -hmm. mechanisms. And so that's been really helpful, but you know, you do have to feel, um, um, or, or I have felt, I should say, you know, a little bit like, you know, you got to kind of fight for your recognition and, and fight for your space. But, um, you know, some of the things that I really appreciated and, and tried to, um, bring forward myself, yeah. you know, are, are having good mentors and then being, you know, on the flip side, kind of being a good mentor and, um, you know, being part of a, a growing network of, of women that are in this space. Um, one of the things that um, I know you've had, we've had conversations about mm -hmm. is, is trying to put together more WANLs. Yes. Uh, right? Yes. With yes. And, the WANLs. And, um, yes. and avoiding the manals. And that's because we do have a different perspective and mm -hmm. um, it's important to have multiple voices um, and it's important to have that recognition. And one of the things that I know I have taught myself to do and learn from others is that sometimes in trying to choose like, who do I want on a panel? Mm -hmm. If you try to go for the person with the highest title and the most experience, you're going to miss out. And sometimes you're going to miss out on some really great women because there hasn't been enough time for younger women to, you know, rise up in the ranks. Now right. we're getting there, um, mm -hmm. but it's kind of testing, you know, testing the, the, um, you know, kind of standard operating procedures. So like, let's just go for the highest, you know, highest ranking person. Um, but no, let's think about right. like, you can have a mix there and, and bring those younger voices in, which sometimes might diversify things more. Um, yeah. One of the things that I have really, enjoy doing is um, building networks of women. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the groups that I've been involved with um, a lot that you know of as well is yes. Women of Electric Vehicles. The WEVs. Um, yes. is, the WEVs um, have been awesome. Um, I participated in the national work and, and that's still going on. And then with a group of great women uh, formed a chapter in the DC area. So I live in the Washington DC area. Um, and we continue to have uh, great um, happy hours. Uh, we're starting a little coffee hour chat um, series. Um, we'll meet up at meetings. Um, we'll do webinars from time to time. People are, you know, kind of a little overloaded with those these days, but um, just a great chance, you know, share job opportunities, share job advice, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, you know, again, it's not always been easy, but I think looking mm -hmm. for those, um, you know, uh, those sponsors and those mentors that can help. Yeah, no, that, that's so critical. Just having that community that you can go yeah. to for resources to like say, hey, you know, how did you navigate X, you know, in your career search or like you said, sharing career opportunities or sharing like a position that comes available mm -hmm. in your organization or on your yeah. team. Um, to look at opportunities to provide women with opportunities to get into the sector. Yeah. I loved your uh, example of, you know, having more women uh, experts on these panels. Because initially, like when I first started working in space, it was far and few between like every other time you might see a woman on a panel. I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute. I know we're working out here. And w when is our opportunity to share our thought leadership and expertise? So I'm glad to see like we're, we're starting to get away from that. And people are calling that out too yeah. um, a lot more yeah. frequently. Like they're like, hey, wait a minute. There's something looks uh, something looks amiss here with these panels. <laughs> so uh, I think you know, having opportunities like to build a community, um, having those professional organizations, having mentors that are able and allies too, they're able mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. navigate that landscape is really helpful. I know for us, one of the reasons we started our e-mobility fellowship program was mm -hmm. to really create those opportunities for career paths and exposure, you know, for young people to the e-mobility sector. And so for those who are not aware, we started the e-mobility fellowship program. It's a nine month curriculum plus an internship, and it trains young people to have a career path in, you know, multimodal electrification, essentially. So we try to expose them to a lot of different areas within the sector. They're taught by subject matter experts, and they have the opportunity to do some programming on their own campus. They do a capstone. 
So um, essentially the thought is that, you know, we're exposing students who are coming from underrepresented backgrounds and they don't all have to be engineers. They can be liberal arts major business. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is that we really need folks from like all different experiences with, you know, all different types of um, thought leadership. So the program is really geared to target Hispanic serving institution, tri uh, tribal and the indigenous institution, trade, technical schools, community colleges, because we don't we know that there's opportunities and value in having students who may not have the opportunity to go to a four year college. And then we bring in historically serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities as well, because we know that young people are under those particular audiences are underrepresented in our sector. So I think there's uh, definitely a lot of opportunities to really kind of open that tent, yeah. and allow more people to kind of come in, come in. Yeah. Well, you just reminded me that I got to see a panel um, of one of your most recent cohorts of that group. Mm -hmm. Um, at your e-mobility um, DEI conference, um, I guess this, what was it? It was like October. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I mean, phenomenal. And they were, it was engineers, it was communications, you know, finance, um, really impressive, you know, future of, you know, the e-mobility world. Um, so kudos you. to you and that, that program. Yeah. Definitely, I'm going to pass that yeah. feedback back to them. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to have a little bit more fun now. So we're going to shift gears for a moment. And so this is the part where we get to know Sue Gander a little bit better. Yeah. So we call this part of the program Five Fun Facts. And so we're going to ask you just, you know, five facts about yourself and maybe some of the, your travel experiences and tips that you would suggest that we uh, utilize. So the first question has to do with where's your favorite place to vacation? Is it a beach? Is it a city? Or is it the mountains? So this was a hard one for me. Uh, Shelly, can I call you Shelly? Because uh, now we're in the fun, fun fact stage. Yes. Um, I love all three of those. I have to say I'm a little more on the mountain side because I grew up in Utah. So I always love my mountains, you know, but Salt Lake City, which is a city. So I have a city it's beautiful and the city. Beautiful city. Um, beautiful city. And the beach. But um, I love vacations where you can combine all three of those mm -hmm. um, or at least two of them. Get a little bit of everything. I was just in Costa Rica. So I got a lot of the beach, a little bit of the mm -hmm. mountains, not so much city. That's right. okay. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you know, I, yeah. I'll, okay. I like going anywhere, really. <laughs> right. Okay, well, that's fine. We've got a combination of locations then. Yes. Yeah. All right. So my next question has to do is like when you're traveling, what is your best travel hack? <sighs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't always follow this rule, but really, you should never check a bag. You really don't know what's going to happen to it. And I've, I've had some horror stories, not like awful, awful, but bad stories about like even trying to not check a bag and then they check your bag and it ends up, you know, 12 hours away and not helpful. You have no clothes. Yeah, really. You're in. Okay. This is the true story. You're in Walmart at 10 o'clock at night looking for an outfit to wear to meet a governor the next day. Going, huh. <laughs> okay, what can oh I possibly goodness. get? <laughs> oh my goodness. So, oh, don't yes. check your bag. Nothing against the airlines, but you never know. That is a good reason not to check yeah. your bag. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh man. Yeah, okay. Well, so this is another travel related one. Okay. So when you're traveling, what's one thing that you won't leave home without? kind of a weird one but um mm -hmm. i like to take my own tea bags okay. with me mm -hmm. because i like drinking tea That's and it's something cool you can that. generally even with a tap water even if you don't have a machine in your room mm -hmm. um you know i like to have a cup of tea before i go to sleep okay and you don't always <laughs> get the best tea even some really nice hotels have really crappy tea so are you always yeah. ready yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. For me, one of the things I always do is yeah. I'll have a, a candle, like a nice candle, because I'm like, oh, when I come back to the hotel room, I just kind of want to like yeah. have serenity and peace. That is nice. Smell good. So it's kind of like, oh, it gives you a nice mm -hmm. just 
mood setting. Um, okay, so okay, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start taking a candle with me. I yeah, like that. I know. See, exchanging yeah. ideas. Yeah. All right. So I have two more, and then we'll okay. uh, ask a couple more questions. And so, okay, what are you reading right now? I'm reading a really great book right now. Mm -hmm. um, I like to actually probably, I usually read multiple books at once, but um, it's called First Ladies. Okay. And it's by one of my favorite authors. Um, her name is Marie Benedict. And mm -hmm. she writes a lot of historical fiction, but focused on women. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Okay. And kind of women sometimes like lost to history or just sort of ignored by history mm -hmm. or maybe just not given enough attention, you know. Um, so some of her books have included like Einstein's wife and wow. um, Churchill's wife. A lot of these are like the wives of, you know, um, but you kind of see behind the scenes what what they brought to the table. Mm -hmm. This one is interesting. It's about two women. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is about two um President's wives, right? Okay, I'm thinking, you know, that's where we are in this nation right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the first chapter, this is a long, long answer, sorry, but no, sorry. building it up here. Um, it's about um, Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt mm -hmm. and Mary McLeod Bethune. Oh. And I was like, wait, why? Mm -hmm. Okay, I kind of knew who she was. So, you know, right. amazing educator, mm -hmm. um, civil rights activist. Well, she was uh, um, honored, I guess, by by um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt by mm -hmm. her naming her the first lady of the struggle. Okay. And so that is why she is in this book as, mm -hmm. and they were very good friends, I should say. They had a great relationship or a great friendship and mm -hmm. great support mechanism. So it's really fascinating to learn about both these women. Um, one who I knew a little bit about and one who I knew very little about. Um, so, and, and it's well, you know, it's just a fun read. It's kind mm -hmm. of fast paced. Okay. So, That's yeah. a great. It's first ladies. Okay. First ladies. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Now, my last question is what form of mobility or transportation did you last use? Was it your personal vehicle, an e-bike, a regular bike, light yeah. rail, something else? So I did drive my my EV, I drive a, a VW ID4 to this yes, trip I had in Annapolis. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I want to put a plug in for walking also. I try to put in a daily walk as well. So I guess mm -hmm. I walked myself to my Excellent. to my That's car fantastic. too. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, so thank you for playing along and sharing a little bit okay. more. About okay. That's fantastic. So okay, before we wrap up, I wanted to circle back to something uh, you know, we were talking about creating community and a space for women to network and provide exposure to careers in this space. So can you talk a little bit more about, we talked touched on mentors and mentorship and allies. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe any words of wisdom that those mentors or allies passed along to you that has made a difference in your success? Sure. Um, I think part of it is, good advice for anyone it, it is partially just to be yourself you know um and and you know not not think about don't put up barriers that that um you know don't need to be there um mm -hmm. let, let others put those up right okay. just be yourself right. yes. um and um this is something that comes from i mentioned i was in costa rica and, and yes. one of the um things that the yoga um, teachers that were there kept saying is ask for what you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good advice for, you know, again, anyone, you know, ask for what you want. Yes. Um, just be clear on that. Um, and then just be brave. You know, it's kind of hard out there sometimes, but just take a deep breath and, you know, press forward. And walk out there. So, <laughs> Those it's are things working. I tell myself every day, anyhow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, no, I mean, obviously it's working well for you because you are, you know, you're you know, doing great work you're with great a great organization and the work that you're doing is so hugely impactful. We're seeing how um, you're seeing the accomplishments. We're seeing the progress like, you know, every day in terms of how we're, how you and your team and, and but your supporters and cheerleaders are moving the needle forward around school bus electrification. So, you know, it was a it was a conversation several years ago when you first started on that project, but it has really yeah. just ramped up. 
Um, and it's really critical and important that we get kids off of these fossil fuel buses uh, and get them into clean transportation. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. So, well, you know what, Sue, this has been a really wonderful conversation. I just appreciate you coming on the show, being part of the series and sharing your insight. And, you know, unfortunately, it has t come for, uh, time for us to close and part ways for the day. <laughs> but uh, I do want to say, I say thank you again for joining us. And we appreciate you for adding your insight. And, you know, continue to stay tuned. Keep us abreast of everything that's happening in the electrification space and how we can continue to, to support and amplify your work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis. It's a pleasure. Big admirer of your work and um, all the space that you've created to have conversations like this, too. So just keep going forward. Awesome. Well, thank you yeah. so much. Sue. Again, she is Sue Gander, director of the Electric School Bus Initiative for WRI. Thanks to our viewers for tuning in and thank you to our team, even Noir, for supporting this series. And check out our other episodes. All right. And so on behalf of Evie Noir, this is Dr. Shelley Francis. We'll see you next time. And we look forward to chatting with other leaders as part of the Women in E-Mobility series. Take care. Thank you.